A very good morning to one and all, our most respected Nobel Laureate of Peace, His Holiness Dalai Lama Ji, learned panelists here on the dais, fellow Vice Chancellors, past Presidents, ladies and gentlemen. 
This is one of the most important sessions of our 92nd annual convention of the Vice Chancellors organized by AIU here at Central Institute of Tibetan Studies, where His, Hol His Holiness Himself is present here to have a dialogue with you on how do you and I and Lai Lamaji together identify values, human values, which are beyond religion, which are secular to the core of their meaning and understanding, which could be adorned, respected, and possessed with pride by the whole of the humanity, not by just one country or the other, or by one cultural group or the other. And therefore, when we have assembled here this morning in the august presence of His Holiness Dalai Lamaji, we shall be spending our time gainfully to understand what are those universal values which can be the hallmark of a human society tuned to the cause for which we are all born. And therefore, in this session, Your Holiness, our focus of attention would be to understand and also to discover the profound meaning and purpose of cultivating these universal values. Yesterday also in the inaugural session, His Holiness has made it clear to one and all that be occupying the highest chair in our university authorities have to understand the value and worth of compassion, what Holiness Sir has called it Karuna. This is beyond religion. This is not akin to a particular cultural group. It is not bound by the geographical boundaries. It belongs to the whole nation, whole world, in fact, whole humanity. And therefore, you have to understand how Karuna can be practiced in our famous Tulsi Ramayana, it says, Bal vivek dam parhit ghole. Bal means takat. Takat var to hum sabko hona hai hona hai. Vivek, we all must have the wisdom of the highest order. Bal vivek dam, sahas bhi hona chahiye. Mere paas bal hai aur sahas nahi hai, wo bal mere tak simit rahega. But then look at the last word, parhit, which means always consciously working for the larger collective good of the society. Val vivek dam parhit ghode daya chama samata raju jore which means daya chama and the feeling of oneness of the whole humanity samata are the cardinal principles on which the human society must trade and transact its activities. These values are not confined to one nation or geographical boundaries. They are the abode for the whole of humanity. Truth belongs to the whole of humanity. Honesty for the whole of humanity. Forgiveness for whole of humanity. Karuna for whole of humanity. Personal integrity and professional morality of the highest order belong to the whole humanity. When Lakshmana was almost on the deathbed, they wanted the services of an expert physician. They could have made a mobile hotline call to Ayodhya and called the, the Raj Bedya there. Hanumana would have brought him as he lifted the whole of the mountain. But they said, call the physician from Sri Lanka, who was the royal physician of the person against whom you are waging the war. But look at the professional morality of the physician of that time, that you would not hesitate, would not even think that he could be doing something other than what a physician is supposed to do at that hour of crisis. And here comes the physician from Sri Lanka and administers, and just in one dose, Lakshmana is back to life with same cheers, smile, vigor, and energy. This is the finest example of professional morality with which the ancient India had traded and transacted. Therefore, in this session, we would be understanding the value and worth of universal values which need to be cultivated, 
which need to be echoed in the corridors of power as well as corridors of our university campuses, which need to be traded and transacted with a smile, which need to be pajed with pride and practiced with pleasure. You could be thrusted upon by values, by the administrators on the top, but that's not value. They are called organizational values. You will have to confine to the dictate of that. But the universal values are not to be thrusted. They should come from within. Your Atma should inspire you to submit to the cause of these values. And therefore, in this session, we shall be carefully having a dialogue in the company of His Holiness to understand, identify, as well as to clarify whatever doubts we have, so that when each one of us as Vice Chancellor go back to our university, our people should say, बदले बदले से सरकार नजर आते हैं जाने के पहले तो ये बातें होती नहीं थी लौटने के बाद ये तो ऐसे बात कर रहे हैं जैसे जलाई लामा जी का स्पेशल आशीर्वाद लेकर के एक मिशन को लेकर के लौटे हैं दोस्तों ऐसी अपेक्षा हमें आप सब से है लेट पीपल से दैट द वाइस चांसलर हैज बीन ट्रांसफॉर्म्ड आफ्टर अटेंडिंग द नाइन्टी सेकेंड कुंभ ऑफ द कुलपति हियर एट वाराणसी एट सारनाथ and I want the same thing to happen beyond Kulpati to the apex bodies also, whose representatives are present here. I want my foreign delegates also to take this message because the values of the kind which we are trying to identify, understand, and adore belong to the whole humanity. Let me finish by saying, Your Excellency, Your Holiness, Sir, we are at a threshold of creating one of the brightest future for the humanity, provided, provided, provided that we understand that as humans, we have the onerous responsibility to create a peaceful world where harmony, peaceful coexistence, respect for all religions, even respect of those, as Holiness said yesterday, those who do not believe in any religion, those who do not even acknowledge the existence of God, we have to consider that all of them are our sisters and brothers. And it is with this kind of mindset, the world will be thousand times more peaceful and beautiful than it is today. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to keep yourself fully glued to the thoughts on this occasion. May I, in this session, we shall request His Holiness to give his opening remarks to invigorate our mind beyond what we have learned so far from the books of the knowledge which we all have read, and whatever little or more meditation of mind which we have already conducted. Please inspire us beyond the limits of knowledge which we have visited, beyond the frontiers of knowledge which we have touched, and beyond the horizons of our wisdom which we have traded and transacted so far. I request His Holiness Dalai Lama Ji to give his opening remarks right at the beginning of this session. Thank you so much indeed. Thank you. Dear brothers and sisters, I have nothing to say. <laughs> Just enjoy uh, seeing your smiling face. That itself, you see, showing us you are the same human being. So then, actually, I'm waiting the real discussions. Mm -hmm. Then, you see, not just one person is to speak something. Uh, 
uh, but rather interaction, way, interaction. Uh, and through that way, I also uh, may get some new understanding through interaction. And uh, you also get some sort of new ideas, new experience. So I'm looking forward to serious discussions. At the beginning, I have nothing to say. Then, one thing, I always used to sleep nine hours, sometimes 10 hours. Then morning, at least three hours, uh, some meditation, mainly analytical meditation, analyze. Firstly, where is I, myself? Then, uh, then everybody, I think yesterday, I think I, I, I think I didn't mention now some occasion our meeting with scientist uh, one sort of picture uh, show one very very uh, in uh, infant child six month old language not yet developed so the real human sort of uh, nature more alive, not polluted or something. Mm. So when uh, that, I think yesterday I mentioned, not here. Hmm? Hmm? So the one one sort of cartoon, two young children play together showing smile and that picture show to that infant child smiling and then another sort of picture cartoon two young children negative attitude one another when the uh, six month old infant child and saw that expression of unhappiness. So then, so some scientists say basic human nature is more compassionate. And then more serious sort of example, a person, constant experience, anger, hatred, actually eating our immune system. Whereas person keep more compassionate mind, very, very helpful to maintain immune system. So these are the scientists, uh, through their experiment, uh, they found that. So then they say basic human nature is more compassionate. When I heard that, I really felt now there is hope. Uh, and then I think obviously, Children, uh, many years ago, in Switzerland, pathology or something, there are some Jewish, Israeli children, Palestinian children, live together and play together. So at that level, they don't care what nation, what faith, but just human, human brothers, sisters. So therefore, uh, at the young age, basic human sort of nature more alive. Once they join education field, then in education, uh, making distinction, political reason or spiritual reason and some other so the reason make distinction. Then these young children uh, gradually develop 
the sense of we and they. So that kind of education, I think, instead of helping human beings keep more alive basic human nature, compassion, but rather oh, too much sort of oh, because of the discrimination, discrimination, we and they. So the existing education system not adequate. Now must pay more attention to how to keep basic human nature that's compassion. Although these things other animals also have, you see that more compassionate feeling, at least towards their own immediate sort of circle. Now we have this brain, so use this brain uh, through education, we can extend sense of concern of others' well-being, not only your own small circle people, but eventually entire uh, human being. As a Buddhist, you see, we all say, as an entire sentient being. So, so then, that kind of sort of, sort of thinking, educate. Then, basic human value there. Then, this brain, you see, should help to further, I said, because of strengthening, or strengthening. So that's lacking now, in spite of basic human nature, wonderful, compassionate. But once join education, not talking these values, but rather talking some other sort of thing. And then mainly, I think modern life, because of that kind of education, I think of very much materialistic life. And with that materialistic culture, Materialistic culture, we always look external thing. Some sports, you get some sort of happiness or something. Uh, then hearing music. You see, never sort of emphasis without relying on a sensorial sort of consciousness, just. Uh, mind, mental, uh, try to train that level. And sensorial experience is just also the way to bring information, but real joyfulness, not with sensorial experience, but mental experience. So therefore, ancient Indian knowledge about mind, uh, training of mind, like shamatha and vivasana. Not training our sensorial thing, but mental thing. So, so now, although these is the information, shamatha, uh, vivasana, these come from religious text. Now, we should take this as an academic subject. Yesterday I mentioned as a sort of uh, knowledge how to bring inner peace. Not talking next life, not talking nirvana, not talking God or Buddha. <laughs> like that. So I'm expecting now some serious discussion now. His Holiness has set the tone for further interaction and discussion. And with us in this very important session, we have Professor Tenjin Negi from Emory University, USA, who have developed the framework for universal values, which could be adopted by the university the world over. And this discussion is to understand what that framework is. And I have also with me two very learned vice chancellors here on the dais, Professor Mishra, Girishwar Mishraji is regularly writing about education 
giving a wake-up call that integrate education with values or else you would be nowhere. And we also have Professor Vera with me here. Both of them would also uh, give their mind before we open for direct interaction and dialogue. So may I request first Professor uh, Negi, Tenjing Negi, sir, to make a presentation. Remember what His Holiness has said, that the current education is not adequate. Education should make a man, in true sense, humane. And if it does not, then all education which we receive could be perhaps taking us in the wrong direction. That's the context in which we would understand the universal values and the role. <coughs> First of all, I would like to pay homage to His Holiness the Dalai Lama from the depth of my heart. Uh, distinguished Vice Chancellors as well as the monastics and the distinguished uh, scholars. This is a really humbling for me to present in the presence of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, the very essence of what His Holiness has devoted for past 30, 40 years to bring into education. So my presentation this morning will be on the values and necessity of secular ethics or universal values uh, in education. As His Holiness just mentioned, our modern education has in many ways prioritize the external development and in uh, the process neglected the inner development uh, and uh, we are seeing the consequences or the impact of such neglect. A World Happiness Report in 2017, they produced a report uh, in which they analyzed based on four different countries in the United States, Australia, United Kingdom and Indonesia with thousands of uh, people participating in this survey to see uh, what constitutes the quality of life, the quality of life. And uh, what they found was that number one predictor, number one factor that uh, is important for our happiness or the quality of life is the mental health. When the mental health is suffering, despite financial development, education, even the certain uh, physical health, they don't uh, contribute towards happiness. It is the mental health that seems the most important. Uh, when it comes to child, the adult mental uh, health, it is predicted that what they found was that childhood mental health, when they were children, what kind of life they had, what kind of mental health. That was a big predictor of the adult mental health. And then when they looked at the children's mental health, what they found was the two factors. Number one, parents' mental health, particularly of the mother's mental health, was very, very important factor, but also the school ambience, the school that they went to, primary and the secondary school, the environment uh, of the school was a major protector. So in, in many ways, as a uh, they conclude uh, which schools a child went to both the primary and secondary predicts as much of how child develops as all the characteristics we, measure, we can measure of mother and father. This is true of what determines the child's emotional health, their behavior, their academic achievement. Implications for policy are momentous. So it really tells that uh, for the policymakers, the government, the, the body of uh, administrators, uh, like the, the very distinguished uh, <coughs> vice chancellors here, um, the what kind of policy we make uh, to inculcate the basic values for our children, uh, it has a tremendous impact on the quality of life. Um, we're seeing today in the world, uh, as the Time magazine reported in 2015, in the teens, those uh, who are between 
12 and 17 years of age. For example, in America, the depression and anxiety are all time high. Over 3 million teens uh, within this age, they experience some kind of major you know, uh, episode of depression. Uh, anxiety also for girls, 30% of the girls going through this. 20% uh, of boys uh, at, at, uh, experiencing anxiety and hopelessness. 30% of teens are experiencing hopelessness. I, will, I don't think this is an isolated situation in the United States, uh, but rather this is something that we can uh, expect in all the industrialized countries, but also countries that are developing like India and others that, that are becoming excessively uh, urbanized. Um, and uh, not only the children who are going through this, but also if you look at the medical profession in the healthcare, um, there also, the, in this meta studies that, that, has, that was done in 43 countries and the hundreds of studies and thousands of people were surveyed in this. What they find, I mean, there are a lot of data, but one thing that comes down to is that 28, or that almost 28, 27 percent of those in the medical line, the medical students and so forth, nurses and so forth, they are experiencing major depression. So in the healthcare also you see that it, and that's true among the teachers and uh, other professionals as well. So what it tells uh, is that, as His Holiness mentioned, um, we need to, to rethink. In the book His Holiness wrote at the turn of the millennium where he proposed a real uh, movement, if you will, um, and uh, uh, His Holiness said that we need a revolution, not of economic, not of political, but rather spiritual. By spiritual, His Holiness said that it has to do with those basic human values like kindness, compassion, forgiveness, and so forth. Uh, how we can make that part of our life, how we can make that culture of our human uh, society, and that needs to come into education. But what I'd like to sh uh, share just briefly is that how qualities like values like compassion can really contribute to our modern day uh, problems. So at Emory University, uh, we have been fortunate to develop uh, a program on compassion training uh, drawn from this rich, the very ancient uh, culture, India, the, the Indo-Tibetan uh, the psychology or the contemplative psychology, the works uh, based on works of like uh, the great masters of Nalanda, like Shanti Deva and the uh, Arya Deva and the Nagarjuna and so forth. Uh, and uh, uh, but put in the universal context, outside of the religious uh, context, uh, we developed a program for developing compassion. It's called cognitively based compassion training, or otherwise in Tibetan it's referred to as. Uh, and uh, uh, so what we did was that we introduced that to uh, uh, freshman college students, first year college students, that they have a lot of stresses. Um, and uh, as his audience mentioned, that a lot of stress eats our immune. It makes us very vulnerable to diseases and also it impairs our emotional health and learning and all those things. So our team with the scientists, we wanted to, to measure if training in compassion can help students deal the psychosocial stresses better. So just to this uh, graph that you are saying, seeing the, um, this uh, represents uh, uh, students from the freshman college students, two groups, one that uh, went to class and practiced the, what, we, what is known as the high practice group, and another group of students who came to the class but did not practice. So they were uh, tested on this before they had the six weeks of training and then uh, also after six weeks of training. What you see uh, on the top uh, graph there, or to the left side one, it's before eight, uh, six weeks of training, uh, there are levels of inflammation. IL-6 is an inflammation, it's an immune response that manifests as inflammation and inflammation uh, is a stress response. When it's too much, it, is, uh, it causes health problems. And uh, many of our modern day illnesses, whether it's uh, Alzheimer's or the cancer or the 
uh, heart diseases and uh, uh, depression and so forth are very highly associated with the high levels of uh, IL-6 inflammation, immune kind of reaction. Uh, lower bar has to do with cortisol. This is a hormone, stress hormone. Uh, again, you can measure in the blood. So basically what you see is that before six weeks of training, there is no difference. After six weeks, uh, there is a big difference uh, in terms of uh, their levels of IL-6 and cortisol. Uh, what it means is that com training in compassion can help one become more robust, have more robust immune and uh, uh, deal with the stress. Uh, compassion is also something sometimes people think that whether it can be trained or not. Um, our studies also uh, measured whether through this training, they get better at the empathy accuracy. Can, can they tell what the people are feeling, looking at their eyes, but also uh, taking the brain images to, of their brains to see certain parts of the brain that is associated with empathy and compassion, whether they, there is a higher activation. In both cases, we see that there is uh, a stronger activation in the brain, but also a more accurate uh, tell, uh, reading of the people's emotions through their face. So that means that uh, compassion can be trained. Also in the medical school, second year medical school, we did a whole host of tests. Uh, for example, uh, do they, um, are they able to maintain compassion in the third year or so? In the medical profession, one of the challenges what's happening is that when people go into the medical school, they go with all the compassion, but by the third year, their compassion drops down. But can we find a way to for them to sustain that compassion. So through this practice, what we found that their, their, their compassion actually uh, strengthens uh, level of compassion. Uh, their sleep kind of uh, disruption goes down. Loneliness actually goes down and the depression also goes down. Um, loneliness is a major, major uh, epidemic in today's world. Vivek, Dr. Vivek uh, Murthy, who was the Surgeon General under Obama uh, for several years in America. He wrote a piece uh, in the Harvard uh, uh, Business Review where it's basically presenting that how in America uh, people are suffering from loneliness. It's the lack of social connectivity. So um, basically what it brings down to is that, uh, you know, again, the World Report has uh, noticed that what we need is uh, to have a new way of thinking, as His Holiness has suggested. So we need to see progress, not in terms of just external progress, but the quality of happiness, level of happiness in the society. And uh, they, they've, uh, they point out that uh, the, what His Holiness calls a secular ethics, or the promotion of basic human values, is the key. They quote His Holiness by saying that for all its benefits, uh, in offering moral guidance in life, religion is no longer. So, so in the multi-religious culture today, a religious approach is not adequate. We need to have a universal or the secular that is, again, based on uh, Indian understanding. So based on His Holiness's writings, the uh, Ethics for New Millennium, Beyond Religion, but also growing body of scientific evidence that we find in social sciences, uh, evolutionary biology, and the uh, uh, neuroscience and so forth, Th those are captured in books like the Triple Focus and so forth. At Emory University, at uh, the uh, uh, encouragement with His Holiness, we have developed a pro uh, the framework, and uh, this, this is the framework we have, and then we are developing some uh, curriculum, uh, two levels of curriculum, first for the basic level of uh, elementary school and the middle school. We will develop high school and uh, college levels as well. But uh, uh, the content of the, this curriculum or this framework uh, is uh, summarized in this uh, graph that you see. There are three domains, three dimensions. Uh, personal domain, you know, like that Daniel Goldman mentions that first we need to develop our inner uh, awareness of our own emotional life. Uh, that requires a very systematic way of looking within, as His Holiness mentioned. You know, in the ancient Indian tradition, there is shamatha, the vipassana, the very sophisticated ways of bringing those internal processes into our awareness. Uh, and uh, through that, we can 
then develop certain ways of dealing with our ups and downs that when we when faced with adversities and so forth. And then by uh, certain practices, we can develop a way of regulating our emotions and the behaviors and so forth. That one is the personal domain, the top kind of horizontal way that if you look at, uh, that's the personal, at the first developing attention and self-awareness. Self-compassion has to do with the dealing with you know, uh, ups and downs or adversities in life. And then self-regulation, meaning that in life, uh, how, what kind of practices we develop uh, by which we can handle our emotions well. And the science is presenting a, a huge body of you know, uh, evidence in these practices, uh, uh, and uh, His Holiness has articulated, we try to capture that in this framework. Second part is the social domain. We are social human beings, as His Holiness mentioned, you know, that we are kind of primed, we are built to be so connect with others. We cannot uh, flourish in uh, isolation. That's why the loneliness is such a, a major kind of source of uh, suffering for us. So in the social domain, we, uh, again, drawing from this rich tradition uh, of uh, ancient India and as preserved in the Tibetan uh, you know, uh, learning centers for many uh, centuries, uh, we bring there the skills for uh, cultivating the awareness of, um, the cultivating empathy, you know, awareness of others, uh, specific practices for developing compassion, uh, and then through that, the social skills, and then uh, on the systemic level, on the global level, um, there again, that not only the interpersonal, but the, we live in a larger society. We are part of the whole, what, what we call the universe, as Einstein said. So at that level, what we need is uh, to have a much broader understanding of systems. And that's where the, the ancient, ancient, ancient uh, uh, insight and wisdom about interdependence, pratitya samutpada, you know, that, that's it, uh, really the key. And the, uh, ways to, ex to help students uh, not only understand intellectually, but rather to arrive at that understanding personally, personalized understanding through critical thinking and the reflections and the, through group uh, activities and so forth and so on. So uh, through that, to come to that aha moment, personal awareness, uh, and uh, you know, through that, the, the developing compassion is what, what, what uh, helps the uh, strengthen the compassion for others and therefore our social interaction, uh, the, the seeing the, the kind of oneness of our humanity and then it were possible to engage in uh, activities uh, at the level of community and perhaps at the global level. So that's really the kind of the heart of this curriculum. It's a very rich uh, comprehensive uh, curriculum uh, with uh, you know, many internal kind of what we call the enduring uh, capabilities and so forth. But uh, uh, as you can see on the far right side, you know, that uh, personal domains belong to emotional intelligence, emotional literacy. And that's where the, the uh, you know, in His Holiness's writing, you see uh, they're drawn from the, the rich Indo-Tibetan tradition of uh, uh, mind science, the very rich presentation of the understanding of mind and emotions, and, uh, uh, and then we try to bring that into our curriculum uh, on the social domain, social intelligence. Again, there are very, very uh, timeless, uh, tested ways of cultivating kindness and compassion, and now the science is telling, as His Holiness presented, that how uh, we have this innate capacity for compassion, but that's very narrow. That is biologically basis, but narrow, unconditional, but narrow. But there are ways to expand, and the, this rich Indo-Tibetan tradition presents many ways to develop and strengthen, uh, expand those compassions. So we bring that, and then on the social, the the, uh, the global or the systemic level, the, the, that is the you know systems uh, intelligence, and uh, well, that that. Um, kind of the, the, when through self-awareness, regulating our emotions, through uh, interpersonal awareness with compassion, through interdependence and awareness, our common humanity, uh, then our engagement, the ethical engagement, the decisions that we make can be very, very meaningful uh, and uh, uh, constructive. And that's where the, the curriculum is uh, focusing. Of course, we draw heavily from the scientific evidence. Uh, His Holiness has uh, 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 emphasized that the 
teaching of the values need to be uh, based on our personal experience, common sense, but also drawn from the scientific uh, evidence. So we draw uh, works of like the great uh, the scientist Paul Ekman, the personal friend of His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Rishi Davidson and others, but also from our classic, the Indian uh, text, uh, you know, like the Abhidha, the like the uh, Pramana Vartika and uh, of the Dharmakirti uh, and the uh, uh, the works of like the Shanti Deva and the uh, Arya Deva and uh, uh, Nagarjuna and so forth. You know that in this way, to really uh, to understand our inner world in a very nuanced and uh, sophisticated way. Of course, to bring that into education, age-appropriate ways, we have to kind of uh, you know work with the development psychologist and the uh, educationist uh, to make it uh, age-appropriate. But uh, as they uh, get to high school uh, or uh, uh, college levels, they can be uh, very kind of uh, sophisticated uh, ways of uh, bringing this education. So uh, we are at quite early stages of developing this curriculum. We have just been about uh, almost three years now. But uh, based on the framework we have developed, we have been uh, training teachers. So far we have trained about 400 teachers. Uh, one, two groups here in India, uh, in Dehradun, one, uh, about 40 uh, teachers, uh, another in Dharamsala, mainly Tibetan teachers, and then in the United States, three places in the United States, and in uh, Germany. Now, um, based on this training that we gave the training to the teachers, then we have given these uh, lessons to the teachers, and then they got the feedback uh, all the teachers find that, uh, you can see 82% of the teachers find, the educators find that these uh, lessons are very, very uh, uh, valuable and effective for the students. Uh, and the 78 of them said the students' engagement is very high. Uh, that is really helpful. We have provided this education. I know that I have to stop. Uh, um, at, uh, just I'll take two more minutes. Um, in the College also, we have. I've been teaching uh, secular ethics. Uh, you know, principle of His Holiness is uh, the, the approach to uh, universal or the secular ethics. Uh, there again, we find that the students there is a very high, uh, you know, enthusiasm among students. And once they take these courses, the surveys show that they want to have more uh, and uh, uh, learn more about the contemplative science, meditation, but also. Uh, how to apply this universal, the education in universal values uh, in practical manners. Very good, uh, you can conclude now because okay, I just, have limited I have time. just literally one minute if I, if I can. Uh, there's one uh, you know, study that we have done at uh, Life University at Emory and also at the prison. Uh, it shows that uh, when you bring this kind of education, the whole host of uh, benefits, you know, from emotional well-being to social well-being and uh, how they manage their emotions and the uh, interpersonal relationship. They, this whole list, you see really strong correlation uh, and these are really uh, very encouraging. Uh, I want to end uh, uh, with uh, his, in, invoking His Holiness. Uh, the, the real, the heart of this has to do with compassion and love, uh, how we can cultivate. So as His Holiness says, Compassion and love are not mere luxuries. As source both of inner and external peace, they are fundamental to the continual, continued survival of our species. They are not, these are not luxuries, but are necessities. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Tenjing. <laughs> Training of mind, listening to your soul, Listening to your inner voice holds the key for understanding the framework presented by Professor Tenjing. We now move on to Professor Girishwar Misra. Misra Saab is one of the highest learned men I have come across among the Kulpatis who is writing regularly every morning. But the time allocated is only three minutes, Professor Misra. And the audience comprises of Kulpatis who require only strings, not details, to understand the comprehension. Professor Misra, please. Give a big applause to Professor Misra. Om Sahana Vavatu Sahana Bhunaktu Saviryam Karavavai Tejasvinavadhi Tamastu 
मा विद्वेषा वहाय ओम शांति 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 परम श्रद्धे दलाई लामा जी यहाँ उपस्थित विभिन्न विश्वविद्यालयों के कुलपति I feel privileged to listen and to experience the warmth which spreads with the presence of His Holiness Dalai Lama Ji. In a very precise sense, he made it very clear that a vast gap has taken place between real human nature and education. I would like to submit that education itself, shiksha, is itself a value. The direction of shiksha should be towards enlightenment, vidya. It should be for making us free, free from various kinds of problems. The whole Yoga Sutras of Patanjali says that we should be free from various kleshas. And avidya is the most important aspect of that klesha. What has happened is that we have forgotten our true nature. And we have considered all the attachments as indicators of true nature. So, we need to have more and more position. And this self-construal, which is taking place largely in the individualistic cultures, is a spreading and becoming a model for those societies which have been collectivist, which mentioned, which maintained certain values which go beyond the individual. So the individual centeredness which is taking place in society is influencing the process of education with great pain. I would like to emphasize that the direction of education which is taking place is increasing individuation and decreasing sociality. The connectedness with society, connectedness with environment. I don't want to go into the details, but even studies total presentation from World Bank talked about engineering. It, it has no mention of humanity or social sciences or what we need to make people more effective human beings, real human beings. There is a lot of data from a number of countries from so many years by students of happiness and that shows that with increase in income, there is no similar increase in the degree of happiness. It has reached to a level and so for a lower level of happiness, you have to pay more. It's not easy. So this is the challenge. This is the trend that is taking place. Now, education is something which should be an instrument for realizing our true nature. And with increasing competition, with increasing value of money, with increasing significance of individuality, we are losing sight of the real, true nature of humanity. His Holiness very clearly identified 
that compassion is something which is intrinsic to human nature. Lot of work with animals and human beings provide this evidence that compassion is something which is experienced from the very beginning. And through leveling, through providing reinforcement for certain behaviors, we install certain specific values, certain kinds of attachments. In Bhagavad Gita, there is a wonderful statement which says that it's yourself which is your best friend and it is yourself which is your best or worst enemy. If you are able to regulate yourself through your own self, then yourself becomes your friend. And if you are not able to do that, then you find that yourself is an enemy for yourself. I think there is a need to recognize who we are, our true nature. And in order to do that, there is a need to have self-introspection. There is a need to have some amount of effort in the direction of self-discovery. And that seems to be a soft area, not very attractive. But if you look at the data, as we have already learned from the earlier presentation, the symptoms which are reported in a large section of adolescents and younger generation in developed countries like USA and other places, the situation is not good. Mental health is weak. It is important to realize that within the educational system, we need to attend to individuality as well as sociality. Thank you. Thank you. At Vardha, we have been trying to develop a scheme and I would like just one minute. Please do justice. It's very important. I would like to refer to four alphabets. CRISP. C means competence. We need to build competence in the domain of self as well as knowledge which is relevant in different domains. The second component is R which means respect for humanity, for others, other individuals, other animals, anything which is present. What kind of connection you must have. Third is yes, yes means social responsibility. You are a human being, you are part of society, and you need to attend to the requirements of society. That is very important. It's pity that more and more people earn and they become less and less interested in social activity. See the participation even in political uh, voting behavior. If you go to cities, you will find that people are not interested. It's important that we must relate to society. So social responsibility is one. And last is P, that is professional responsibility. And professional responsibility is, is at stake. I don't want to elaborate, but the kind of challenges that we find from ethical angles, from plagiarism, and so many issues, so crisp, the four components, competence, and one I missed, I, that is integrity. Integrity, respect, social responsibility, and professional responsibility. These are the components which require attention within our university system or even education in, in a school system also. It's very important to create a foundation which is humane, where you respect other human beings, it's difficult how that can be translated. The curriculum for teachers must have a very large component for that. 
at university level we have hardly any curriculum for teachers so you can teach without knowing teaching or without having compassion or having any understanding of process of how one can become a better human being i have uh, no time and i take this opportunity to thank professor sharma his team and this great organization which has thought of addressing the question of value in this meeting and that is the beginning we need to create an agenda for professional ethics for university teachers i think that is something which should be contributed by this gathering thank you very much thank you professor mishra for your words of advice and words of wisdom what professor mishra said must be understood in the right earnest atmah atmane bandhu atmah ripu atmana atma hi aapka dost hai aur atma hi aapka dushman hai isliye atma ki awaaz ko sunna hamare liye zaruri hai kis bhasha mein atma bolti hai this is a matter of research it could be in the form of emotions it could be in the form of feelings it could be in the in a language which is yet to be discovered but that's the context so i invite now professor vera to enlighten us further sir time allotted is another 3 minutes but be as crisp as possible he is holiness and uh, most uh, respected and revered the dalai lama ji the moderator of this session professor sharma ji co panelist uh, professor tenjin and professor misra ji secretary general of uh, aiu professor purkan kumar ji landed colleagues from different parts of the country overseas delegates students research scholar and faculty members of this great institution so um i would like to you know view the whole thing from a different perspective but i am a social anthropologist by training and uh, i would like to address the whole problem from anthropological perspective okay this is an assembly of global education leader of the 21st century and uh, we as educational leader deal with uh, the young minds younger generation and uh, we inculcate in them a spirit of competitiveness individualism which finally lead to you know a kind of uh, self centric attitude and then uh, we know that uh, technological transformation and innovation have brought uh, you know a lot many disruption i would not hesitate to say even destruction so what is the need of the hour how you know we you know i am reminded of a research recently being conducted by stanford university where they wanted to study the young minds and they wanted to know do you want to be successful that was the question and students said yes we want to be successful and then the next question what do you require to be successful and then they say skill and then they asked to in what proportion you require skill domain knowledge and soft skill and then this stanford study come out with a finding that uh, you require 80% soft skill and 20% domain knowledge to make a breakthrough in your career but now you know i i, I would like to develop a chain of thoughts like if success skill and skill and then mind because all these skills come from mind so we have heard about soft skill but can there be a term like softest skill i request his holiness uh, dalai lama ji to address this question then uh, can meditation and prayer be the softest skill see professor tenjing summer in passing made a mention about the children yes our children are overburdened overworked 
over schedule and they move from infancy to adulthood without experiencing childhood. Many of our young generation are members of a dual career family or life career family where everyone is striving for success, parents and children. So children feel lonely, depressed and then there is also, you know, you know there is uh, anger, frustration because the rising rate of unemployment have made them has made them feel frustrated and that is why there is a need you know how we train our students younger generation the human values as far my subject goes you know each culture has its own values and ethics and it is bound by time and space but at the same time over and above there are some human values which are common to all society and all culture across the time and that is what we should learn and uh, you know when we try to be ethnocentric you know and uh, this ethnocentrism means uh, we consider our culture to be superior and we rate and evaluate other culture in terms of our cultural standard and then that is the point where we go wrong and wrong seriously and that is why, you know, in anthropology we call, you know, cultural universal. No culture is superior or inferior. Every culture has its own merits. So it is time to learn from different cultures. So that is what we talk about cultural pluralism, uh, salad bowl theory where there is real integration. You know, each item in a salad has its own identity. But when you test them, it gives you a different test. It doesn't give you the test of each individual ingredient that is uh, you know unity emits diversity and uh, rightly you know how modern education has given us comfort but uh, ancient education rightly said by his holiness that gives us peace joy and happiness so if you ask me sustainable development sustainable development uh, is that kind of development which gives you inner joy, peace, harmony and which makes you learn to live in harmony with nature, environment and which helps you to learn to respect other culture and other religion. So I, I was going through his book, uh, Beyond Religion and uh, I'm very impressed sir, uh, where I read that uh, let us renew our commitment for human values and uh, let us strive together with vision, courage and optimism. With this, I conclude my lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Behra. Thank you for being so crisp and so straightforward. The question before you now in the interactive session is to go now and synergize the brainwaves of the vice chancellors and all those attending this session to once again thresh out very clearly the secular value, the word secular is underlined because that will make it universal, otherwise it will belong to a particular territory. His Holiness is very clear in his mind that we need to talk of universal values. So any burning questions in your mind on the universal values of the kind which you would like to trade in transit? So many hands, so you can see, sir, so much interest. Uh, very difficult. I'll go over there with the person with the spectacles who has perhaps spent a lot of time reading, thinking, meditating and doing yoga exercise. Please. Yeah. Um, Seal Nona from the Queensland University of Technology in Australia. You know, in India we had this whole tradition of education institutions where we used to say that the institutions are the seat of education and learning. And with the learning we used to get a lot of human values and the human touch. Over a period of time, we see that the learning has come out and the institutions are becoming only the seat of education. The question is, what is gone wrong where the learning has come out from education and what can be done to bring the learning back to education institutions so that we are able to imbibe the human values? Yes, sir. Your Holiness, you want to respond right now. What yes. has gone wrong in our learning that we have taken out the training of mind and listening to the soul out of our learning exercise. Of course, my knowledge is limited. 
But it seems to me the so-called modern education started from the West. I think yesterday also I already mentioned. So the people, you see, when science and technology develop, that brings benefit or comfort immediately. Uh, prayer, maybe long future, <laughs> but not much helpful immediately. So therefore, people are very much excited about material development. So, uh, I feel education mainly focusing about material development. This is my feeling. I think the answer is very straight. The connect is to be discovered and restored. We have the Honorable Vice Chancellor over there. Please. Good morning, sir. I'm Dr. Vivek Sauji from uh, Be Belgium. Sir, Your Holiness, yesterday in your speech, you yes. mentioned about uh, emotional hygiene. And you said that we practice physical hygiene, but we don't practice emotional hygiene. And from the speakers, we've heard that fear, frustration, anger, some of these are the issues which have been really taking toll on all of us. So how can we practice emotional hygiene? And is there anything, I mean, we would like to learn more about it from Your Holiness. Sir, how to practice emotional hygiene? And that too in a manner that we can practice in five minutes. Now, some, you see, people, some scientists, like Paul Ekman, hmm, now identify certain different emotions. Uh, that's helpful. Now, in ancient Indian psychology, I think the very, very detailed explanation about uh, different minds, some of the symptoms can disagree. Mind and mental factors. Okay, just So mind, usually we say six minds. And then according to Chitta Mantra, eight minds. Then Kasa, Simju. Mental factor, uh, 51. And some text, even more. So this, very, very useful. You see the, the emotions yeah, are one of them. So how it develop and what kind of connection within these different mental factors. Madam sitting next to the Honorable so, Vice Chancellor. So now important is, mm, as an academic subject, uh, I think uh, very useful to study in textbook about these, uh, how should they, because of the mind. The of mind. Oh. And then also the uh, sensory level consciousness that occur only awaking time. Then during dreaming time, another level of consciousness. Sensory consciousness no longer, but mental consciousness still there. Then Deep sleep without dream, more deeper. Then it faint, a time of faint, even deeper consciousness. Now some American scientists now uh, carry some project, so the investigation at the time of death, physically death. Uh, heart beating stop, brain activity stop, dead, but body still remain fresh. So the only explanation is the subtle mind, innermost the subtle mind still in the center of channel. So this, I think, quite useful uh, for as the academic subject, and that very useful for hygiene of emotion. 
Mental hygiene very important. Madam asked a straight question to the Honorable Holiness, sir. Shout at the top of your voice because we are already shouting in our classrooms. I, I think better microphone. Compassion Otherwise, in your speech. Oh, yes. So I would like to uh, hear from you about uh, the gender disparity and violence against two women, young girls, and even killing the uh, female feticide in our educated, civilized society. That happens more. We should be more concerned about being educated, and it still persists. Ah. It's a ground reality, social reality. I would like to seek your views on this. Another thing is that. In our modern education system, because of digitalization, we are losing human touch. Yesterday, we were discussing classroom teacher-student relationship is declining, and we are gaining knowledge from digital world. So less of human touch, how can we encourage human compassion? How can competition and compassion go together? That is what I would like how to... How can compassion and competition go together? Hey, holy some, some different sort of points now. Uh, discrimination, male and female. I think they like a farming system, these things, physically, male, more sort of kasoda, useful. So in ancient time, so some kind of discrimination. That even, you see, uh, influence or effect in the religious field. But then uh, Buddha, make very much emphasis equal, male and female. Bhikshu, the highest sort of vow or celibate. And then similarly, Bhikshu ni. So in any way, uh, uh, our society, I think still old thinking, traces, traces of old thinking. Now, for example, in this country, unfortunately, caste system uh, still there. I think these, I think the the certain sort of tradition come from feudal system. Now feudal system gone. Now we we are at the, at the time democratic sort of society. Everybody equal under law from president or beggar, same. So, uh, India's constitution give us equal right, but in backward area, still caste system, still there. These, I think, through education. And mainly, I feel religious leader should come out now say, uh, this discrimination on the basis of caste system is outdated. So this is some. So similarly, male, female, and and I think basically, the male need female, female need male equal. Thank you, sir. We have the next question from uh, and then, Vice Chancellor. Then I'll come to Madam. Then, yes, please. Then you know, mother is female. Mother is, I think, the ultimate source of love, compassion. As soon as we're born, without mother's love, we no longer there, we die. So, very our life survived with uh, parents' care, particularly mother's care and mother's milk. So, in the society, mother is the ultimate source of also compassion, love. So, I often use it telling uh, the now education alone, existing education alone, not sufficient. We must make more effort for promotion of compassion. In that respect, female should take more active role. Very good. If love is God, we need to understand love is Atmita. 
otherwise that love will come something else. So, next question from the professor, sir. Sita Ramarao. Uh, His Holiness, uh, I would like to know from you, sir. Uh, so far, human civilization underwent agriculture revolution, industrial revolution, tech, technological revolution, and IT revolution, so going on. Nanotechnology revolution also may come in future. But it is mentioned about the spiritual revolution in the human kind, human humanity. What is spiritual revolution? How it should be brought in in the society and world as a whole? This is my question, sir. I would is like. Is there to. any scope for a spiritual revolution along with information technology revolution and the revolution of the fifth generation science and technology? It is very important to make distinction spirituality. Uh, with religious belief and another spirituality, just secular ethics. Oh. You see, these, I think, now religious matter to religious people. Hmm? Sometimes they use wrong way. <laughs> I think one famous news, the uh, one spiritual leader in Haryana, now in prison. <laughs> <laughs> so sometimes, you see, the spiritual spirituality with faith sometimes you see become instrument exploitation. I think that uh, no need to human being. The other hand, the essence of various spiritual tradition. The essence message is message of love. Now that, so long we human beings remain on this planet with sophisticated mind, human love is very essential. So yeah. now, the religious, I mean spirituality with religious faith, not adequate. So, now we need thousand year old Indian tradition, secular. Well, we will thresh out this question further whether spirituality is secular because spirituality is considered to be beyond religion. But we have shortage of time and I can see hundred cents going one, up. One question. The difficult task is how do I assimilate? I, Madam, very quickly in 10 seconds your question. I'll come to you in a minute. I have three no, questions in I my raised, hand. I raised my no, hand. No, 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 no. Let Madam speak. Acha. Please. Yeah, please. Move the microphone quickly as fast as possible. Well, very quickly and a question not just for students but from uh, also the personal context. Uh, when we talk of introducing compassion which was missing in the education because of the Western influence, what we also mean is that we have to make space for it. That means the Western, the technical, the scientific uh, education becomes a bit slower. I, as a student, am likely to accept an education like that if I see that after learning this new bit that is being introduced in my system, that's how a student sees the syllabus, I will still get something that I want to get and I will reach somewhere that I want to reach. And then for me as a student to accept the new system, I need to have faith. And I think today's concern and the big concern is that, that faith is something I don't... Main consider. point, your question, main point? Faith, faith. Faith, to be able to experiment, introducing compassion in education. I, as a student, I, as a teacher, lack the faith. Now, I feel time come. The promotion, or basis of promotion of, of compassion, uh, instead of based on religion, but based on science. Now, scientific finding. As I mentioned before, the scientist now who sort of carry some sort of observation or research, basic human nature is more compassionate. Uh, and then I think as far as the Buddha, Buddhism is concerned, Buddha himself, you see, emphasis importance of reason, experiment rather than faith. So therefore, I think today, in past, you see, we sort of relying on our guru. 
Now I think better to rely on scientist. Good. Now what I will do, <laughs> His Holiness will answer together all the questions. I have two questions to read out, then I will ask my two vice chancellors also to say. What are the questions? His Holiness is how do you spread happiness in the rural areas where people are suffering and having tremendous amount of unhappiness? Another question from the learned vice chancellor is. Uh, this one. How one can balance between materialism, which means prosperity, and happiness? How do I balance that? That's the second question from one of the vice chancellors. And I've got two more vice chancellors raising hands. Uh, I think wait, 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 wait. Uh, too many questions together, uh, not remain in my mind. <laughs> so, out of compassion to me, I think let me answer after each compassion, okay. uh, each question. Yes, Please. now. Professor Ramachandran. I think rural area. I think now rural area is still lacking education. So maybe some faith there, but this faith is a uh, blind faith, uh, not much thinking. So these blind faith will not remain eventually better education. These will go. So now the rural area, I think education is the key factor. Okay. Uh, very good morning, sir. In the area of globalization, everybody they accept globalization. Country borderless people are accepted everywhere in the world. And people of various linguistics discriminations are also permitted to some extent. But not so. Question, question now. Question point. Yeah, I'm coming to that. You said female is female is equal to male. We totally agree on that. How to bring them into practice? How do you practice, sir, that woman is equal to man? That's or even, even better than man, I mean. That's the, like that. that is based on conviction. If compassion remains lip service, then will not carry action, in action. The, through analyze, through explanation, on the basis of scientific finding, once you really develop conviction, ah, compassion is really, uh, so they, immense help uh, to my peace of mind and through that way physical health and a happy family, happy community. Then action come. Compassion so long remain because of the lip service then not much effect. You have to train your mind for compassion otherwise it will remain lip service sir. Yes, sir. Honorable Vice Chancellor. Yes, sir. <laughs> Myself, Professor Hari Kesing, Vice Chancellor, Jayaprakash University, Chhapra, Bihar. My direct question is whether it is proper to say waste, W E S T, whether waste is W A S T, and then we say that secular ethics. It is very contradictory. Ethics is sufficient. The moment we prefix secular, again we are making a new sect. Ethics itself is sufficient. It, the maturity of the ethics is secular in its temperament. So, sir, we have to think that this is not the age of disruption. It is a pessimistic approach to perceive and see that the whole era is disruptive. Neither the technology is disruptive. It is the mind of the people, the mind of the men, that is disruptive. Very so good, east is point. east, west is west. This dichotomy should also be now removed from the mind with along the ethical maturity. Yes, sir. Not clear. Point, point huh? is well taken, sir. But if you say ethics only, people say whose ethics are they? And I will need trouble to answer that because they will say they belong to you, may not belong to me. That's why the word secular. It's not for oh. adulterating ethics. It's not for diluting the importance okay. of ethics. Oh. But his yeah. Every, every human action is related with motivation. 
any action, including preaching, with the motivation, with selfish or some kind of negative emotion, then every human action, including teaching or dharma, also become destructive. So ultimately, and every human profession, in order to become constructive, related with mind, motivation. That's I feel. The motivation, too much self-centered motivation, uh, actually the very nature of selfish is narrow-minded. Thinking yourself. The compassionate mind think other. So automatically, mind become more open. Just a selfish, think yourself. Very narrow-minded. And with that narrow-minded, even small problem appears as the unbearable. More compassionate attitude, even serious problem. Uh, you, have, you will have the, have the feeling, oh, this is problem, have to solve. But not only this problem, but there are many positive things there. So compassionate mind, open our mind. The holistic attitude develop. The self-centered attitude uh, in only kasa. The, the, the narrow mind, the focusing, very, very narrow area. And then, I think I want to mention one of my friend, one scientist, Aaron Beck, now over 100 years old. He, not a religious mind, minded, you see, he, uh, I said, the, the helping people whose uh, mind too much sort of disturbed by anger. Now he, uh, when I met his age already, 84, uh, he mentioned when people develop anger, the, the object which that person feels angry appears very negative, but actually 90% of that negativeness is mental projection. So therefore, in that respect, quantum physics is very useful. You see, to, to reduce the very basis of exaggeration. As far as Buddha Dharma is concerned, Buddhist philosophy is concerned, Shunyata, the concept of Patit Samupad, everything interdependent, no absolute. So that reduces the intensity of anger. Like that. So therefore, the uh, now even scientists now, now the, the, the that scientist I think really experienced one. So destructive emotion develop is much based on exaggeration. And now recently, one Chinese in China, one Chinese uh, uh, quantum physicist, he mentioned that. Those scientists who really convinced quantum physics, they sort of the very basis of mental exaggeration, much thinner. This is a scientific explanation. Marve, this one. Honorable Vice Chancellors, I am already committing a breach of Western ethics where time allotted should not be exceeded by more than five minutes if you are in India. Now I've already exceeded 10 minutes. So my left brain was totally dead for a time. Suddenly I find that it has come to life. So last question, Professor Isaac, if you, yeah, if you do second. not mind, I think, yeah. because the time is very short. Yeah, I'll just uh, brief it once. You see, I hail from Kerala. Uh, Kerala is 100% literate state. You find that uh, the discrimination based on sex the fights based on caste system are all diminishing, decreasing trend. That's what you said, that education will definitely improve it. But today I find that political animosity, fights and killings are on the increase. Sir has already answered, shake off those traditions which have become outdated. As simple as that. 
लास्ट क्वेश्चन सर फ्रॉम द सेक्रेटरी जनरल यू हैव टू डू जस्टिस अदरवाइज नॉट अर्न माई टी ए बिल आई थिंक आई थिंक इफ पॉसिबल यू सेटअप वन स्मॉल सोट ऑफ सोसाइटी टू टीच अबाउट दिस मेंटल सिस्टम टू पॉलिटिशियंस your your holiness i often find myself in a dilemma as to how to understand this phenomena and this phenomena is that at times i find people at individual level very compassionate very understanding very respectful of a variety of culture but at a collective level in a group at a national level they are not as compassionate what is this and how do we explain this this is very clear very clear these leaders come from a society where because of the education not much talking about inner value so these individual come from that kind of society that kind of education so naturally more selfish short sighted like that so only thing uh, today's problem basically 7 billion human being uh, no one has one problem yet many problem of course a nature disaster this is something different beyond our control but many problem essentially our own creation why nobody want a problem but m- human being themselves create a lot of problem why the lack of moral principle that lack of conviction about this uh, altruistic sort of attitudes value the so man. now education is the key factor right to pray will not change only through education awareness now gradually i think one generation pass the second generation who come through uh, that kind of education then there is a real hope very good so training of the mind and listening to the soul require mass exercise for yoga and meditation not just individual one now we are really run out of time but you can kindly very quickly tell us because you are standing for some time honorable vice chancellor very i mean i have to bind up because otherwise i'll be thrown out but maybe i'm protected by his holiness till he is there on the on the dais his holiness i am dr bp veerabhadrappa from davangere university karnataka southern india in the days of liberalization education has been commercialized either in the west or in the east and spiritual values and religious values are fading away yesterday you talked about dharma yesterday you talked about values but what has actually happened in the days of globalization and liberalization because of the commercialization of higher education values are declining social values religious yeah. values right. and spiritual values kindly uh, that is mainly please. education or existing education is very much oriented about material value not much talk about inner value therefore now we are uh, making effort uh, to for the day uh, the the education should include about inner value then as i meant earlier next generation who come through that kind of education then i think uh, society not a materialistic society materialistic culture a uh, society uh, of course need material value but at the same time also you say look from internal value then i think things politics politics or economy or many field then becoming more as a day peaceful or more honest more truthful so Com- this competition no no not not sufficient to complain these things uh now we have to think uh, the long term that i believe only education the education existing education 
only oriented about uh, uh, material value like that. Integration of education with values holds the promise. Last word from Go East policy from the Nehu Vice Chancellor Professor Srivastava. We have heard about Buddham, Sharanam, Gachami. It will be a pleasure to all of us and learning experience from you to hear about it from you, Your Highness. Karsa. Buddham, Sharanam, Gachami. Could you please elaborate the message which is closely connected with the present theme of the yes. conference? I think the very word Buddha means negative things completely kasoda ka eliminated uh, then the very nature of our mind have the uh, have the pot have the potential or ability to know things so long ignorance there our knowing limited once ignorance completely disappear then the nature's full potential knowing everything so that means that means buddha eliminate uh, ignorance and then fully or say they develop all the potential of mind that's meaning of buddha now important is the i think in as far as Buddha Dharma is concerned, now it is important. Buddha not come from outside, but our very nature of our mind is Buddha nature. Tata Gata Garva or Sugata Shindaya. So this very mind at the moment dominant by ignorance. Once ignorance remove that very sort of nature of this mind become Buddha's mind. <laughs> but not easy. <laughs> uh, saying easy, within a uh, few years you may achieve Buddhahood, but it seems nobody achieved that within that short period. <laughs> but as a Buddhist practitioner, student of Nalanda tradition, not just faith, but analyze, 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 uh, analytical meditation, according to my own experience, immense effect on my own emotion. It's very clear, every emotion based on ignorance, the opposition of emotion, that's wisdom based on reason. So, wisdom has much more powerful than uh, ignorance. Ignorance, because of ignorance, sorry, destructive emotion. Destructive emotion, no valid base. Oh, the wisdom side, valid base. So, we can, we can strengthen that, uh, not day by day, but decade by decade, we can increase the power of wisdom sight. So more deeper experience about wisdom, the opposite ignorance automatically reduces. Once ignorance reduces, all destructive emotion which based on ignorance and then become thinner, thinner, thinner. Your Excellency, it was a real privilege to be in your company. To train our mind, to train our mind in vocationness, a sense of responsibility toward listening to ourselves, listening to our soul, also understanding that our own soul is our friend and also our enemy, as has been rightly said by Dr. Misra. Atmaha Atmane Bandhu Atmane Ripu Atmana is the call of the Upanishads and also of the Bhagavad Gita. I think we are confronted now with a major challenge. How do I go back and integrate secular values in education so that the generation which we prepare to trade and transact in 21st century would understand that competition 
is not about encasing the weakness of the competitor, but competition is about encasing your own strength. And that way, a level play field would be available. To sum up this important uh, discussion, interaction, I submit to you, Your Holiness, that the very purpose of education is not just jnana, but it must include the dimension of acharan, which is behavior, and dimension of charitra, which is the character, integrity, and morality. And therefore, the integration of universal values with education can only ensure that all the three dimensions, namely the jnana, the behavior, and the character are cultivated together rather than leaving them for desired to be cultivated after obtaining the degree. There are instances in our Vedas where the vice chancellor had denied the conferment of degree to a person who otherwise passed all the examinations with 100 out of 100. And he was asked how the degree is being denied when he has already passed all the subjects which we have assigned. Politely, the Kulpati said, on the dimension of behavior and dimension of charitra, the fellow does not measure up to the mark for the conferment of the degree. That kind of courage exhibited by the Kulguru, the Kulpati of ancient India, made, in fact, India the wonder that was. Question is, can we return to our roots and discover the value and worth of these secular values which will cultivate the dimension of behavior and character along with dimensions of knowledge so important to trade and transact in 21st century. Last but not the least, very many values have been echoed here in this hall. To begin with, honesty and truthfulness go together. The feeling of oneness is very important to cultivate atmita, the empathy or compassion, as His Holiness suggests. And oneness can only come when you listen to your soul rather than the outwardly diversity which you see. The value of peace and peaceful coexistence cannot be given a go by today when we see so much unrest. Love for diversity and discovering unity and diversity which has been the core value of our ancient civilization must also be scored as a secular value because it does not confine itself to any national boundary. Respect for all religions and respect even of those who don't believe in any religion or even do not acknowledge even the existence of God has to be one of the very important value to establish a society where peaceful coexistence and harmony would exist together. Compassion and forgiveness and the feeling of going out of way even to help those who deserve help because we have every reason to give our very best to the society holds an important promise. I leave behind you with these thoughts and make a proposition before you. If you would like, you may resolve that this house resolves that each university, to the best of its ability, must establish a center for secular ethics, professional morality, and scientific values so that we are in a position to ensure that the dimension of behavior and character is cultivated along with the dimensions of knowledge and jnana in our universities. Each university can do it in a small or a big way, depending upon its own uh, agenda, but the beginning must be made immediately hereafter as we reach back to our university. With this proposition, may I take this opportunity to express my profound gratitude on behalf of all the vice chancellors present here to thank you from the core of our heart for spending your whole day yesterday and morning today to invigorate our mind. May I also take this opportunity to thank my learned panelists, including Professor Tenjing, who has carried out a deep scientific study to overscore the importance of secular ethics, training of mind, emotional hygiene, and emotional intelligence so important today to make us in true sense human beings. And last but not the least, I must thank each one of you to allow me not to allow some to speak and also to ensure that we are in a position to finish more or less in time, except that we have overstepped, as I said, the Western ethics of sticking to the time frame which is allotted to all of us. With these words, ladies and gentlemen, may I thank you
for your patience hearing and very active participation in this very important session. Thank you, Dr. Shempton, also for giving us this opportunity to host the convention at your university. Thank you, Your Holiness.